Uh, we're talking about uh, compressible flow effects and especially one-dimensional analysis of nozzles, and that's what we're wrapping up with. What's that at the back of a jet engine? Nozzle. There, that's what I show in this illustration. So uh, this nozzle, can you tell it can sh change shape, open up a little bit and close? So in aerodynamics, you sometimes start below Mach 1 and then go to Mach 1, or you, it's advantageous to change the shape uh, of the nozzle. Air enters a nozzle at a 10 bar. 10 bar, I usually like to convert those right away to 1,000 kilopascal. It enters at 530 Kelvin and 60 meters per second. It exits at 5 bar or 500 kPa and 470 Kelvin. The mass flow rate is m dot is equal to 1 kilogram per second. Determine the inlet area. So we have a nozzle and we'll talk about area 1, the exit area, state 2, area 2, units meter squared, meter squared for both of those. And then for part C, what's the force exerted by the air on the duct. So um, we're going to introduce a control volume which does not include the duct. It includes the air up to the edge of the metal lining of the duct. So that's our control volume. And so the air exerts a force on the duct, but it's an equal and opposite force that the duct exerts on the air. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve for the force that the air exerts on the duct. How do you like that subscript? You understand that A, that it's air on duct. And that's going to be negative of the force that the duct exerts on the air. And then when I do an analysis of the control volume, I want all the forces on the air. So this force right here is the net resultant force of the duct on the air, and I just put it in the positive x direction, indicating that it's going to make it want to pushing on the positive x direction. Okay, maybe I don't have a good sense of the actual physical direction, All right? When you look at it, it says, hold it, the duct's going to suck on the air and pull it to the right? Probably not. Probably not. True? If you're saying physically, I think that it's going to be the opposite direction, I think you're right. But let's leave it as a, in the positive direction, okay? Now, for the rest of this analysis on surface one here, we're going to have pressure acting over the face. So we have P1, and if you multiply by A1, the area, what do you get? A net force pushing in the positive x direction. We look at this surface two, and we have pressure, but what way does the pressure push on the surface at 2 in the negative direction. That always throws students for a loop, uh, but I think you're probably past that because you've taken statics and dynamics, right? And you've seen that they had to struggle with that concept. So this is the magnitude is P2A2, right? Okay, so now if you just said a force imbalance, you'd say, hey, uh, you have the pressure times the area 1, that's in the positive x, P2, A2, and the negative x, and you have the force that the duct exerts on the air in the positive x. That can lead to an acceleration. So you can say, okay, I know this law. I forgot the name of that law. Is it uh, Jacoby's 18th law? No, no, no. You know, Seidel's. Third law? No, no, no. What is it? It's Newton's second law. And so we're going to have sum of forces, and instead of saying mass times acceleration, 
we'll do something like this. Time rate of change of the linear momentum, MV. And we're really interested in control volume analysis. And I know I'm trying to jump in a few steps here, but it's, the, it's, it's as if this is uh, m dot v minus m dot v. All right? And it's, if the net positive force pushing in the x direction, it makes it want to flow out at v2, at, at the area 2 with the high v2. And so this m dot's the same, and I'll put a 2. That's a positive flow of momentum with the mass flowing out at 2. And it comes in at 1. So if I have some inflow, v1 there. So I have m dot v2 minus v1. What do the, these net... If there's a net imbalance of the forces, what happens? As I have an increase in the linear momentum flow rate of the fluid through the control volume. Okay? So now I just have to write what are my forces and everything I've lined up and tried to get in the positive x direction so that I can write it down. We'll have a P1A1 in the positive x minus P2A2 because it's in the negative x. And we'll have plus the force that the duct exerts on the air. Thumbs up if you like that equation. <laughs> Ask me a question if you may, you know, want to clarify something here. Can you see how I got the equation? I'm going to use this to solve for part C. But I need to first uh, solve for part A. But for part A... How do I solve it? I say, well, the mass flow rate, which is known, it's one kilogram per second, is equal to rho 1 A1 V1, or uh, 1 over the specific volume at 1 times the area 1 V1. True? Is that all true? And then I look up here and I say, V1, 60 meters per second. Good. A1, don't know, but I'd like to calculate it. V1, can I calculate V1? I'll use the ideal gas equation. R T1 over P1. So there's T1. There's P1. R is a constant for air. And so I get the specific volume of 1, put it in here. And the mass flow rate, I know. So I can solve for A1 is equal to the mass flow rate times the specific volume divided by V1. Follow that logic? So we calculate the area inlet from uh, mass flow considerations. That area inlet is 2.54 10 to the minus 3 meters squared. How about the answer to part B? The B is very similar. It's going to be the mass flow rate. Whoops, let me just write it. Area 2 is going to be the mass flow rate, specific volume at 2 divided by the velocity at 2. True? Ah, uh, did they give me the velocity at 2? Hey, they gave me the velocity at 1, didn't they? How am I going to get the velocity at 2? If we do an energy balance, change in the enthalpy h1 minus h2 is equal to the change in the kinetic energy so the enthalpy goes down kinetic energy goes up and so we can then solve for v2 is equal to v1 squared plus two constant specific heat constant specific heat constant pressure times t1 minus t2 square root I need to evaluate properties for air. The average temperature is 500 Kelvin. Just take T1 plus T2 divided by 2, you have 500 Kelvin. So you can go get C sub P. C sub P is 1.029 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. 
Notice uh, when you do a lot of these problems, sometimes you're like, you anticipate the unit conversion. C sub P could also be reported as 1,029 meters squared per second squared Kelvin. I know nobody reports it like that, but it's units and everything else, it's good. <laughs> okay? And uh, maybe this way you, you stick it in that way. Just don't forget that, that, um, that factor. Also K, I'll just write it up there. Um, the K is 1.387 at that temperature for air. So we calculate V2, and it comes in at 356.5 meters per second. Hence, you now can go back to this equation and calculate A2. A2 is 7.57 times 10 to the minus 4 meters squared. So we return now to the momentum equation or Newton's second law. Same thing, right? That's what you can express. Newton's second law is basically a momentum equation. And we can... Um, I'm going to try and do this. I'm going to tuck it in just a little bit right under here. If I um, take that pressure times that area for P1A1, I think I calculate 2535 newtons. P2A2 comes in at 378 newtons. And I don't know the force that the duct has on the air, so I leave that as my unknown. And I, ca I know the M dot and I know the, the, the Vs, and that's 296.5 Newtons. So I forgot to put the Newton there and the Newton there. So what we do is we solve for the force that the duct exerts on the air, and we find that it's equal to negative 1860 Newtons. So now we can answer the question, which is what is the force exerted by the air on the duct? So the force that the air exerts on the duct is a positive 1860 newtons. Make sense? And if you look at it again, uh, the duct um, the force that the duct exerts on the air is pushing it back. It's in the negative direction. The force that the air exerts on the duct is in the positive direction. So consider flow of an ideal gas in a nozzle. Here it's shaped right here, inlet one and outlet two. And it's isentropic. Boy, I didn't spell that right, did I? I-S-E-N-T-R-O-P-I-C. Oops, misspell. All right. So think about given an inlet temperature and an inlet pressure and an inlet area and an exit pressure and an exit area, but not knowing the exit temperature, that would be an unknown, T2 is unknown, and not knowing V1, the inlet velocity, or V2, the exit velocity, or the mass flow rate that flows through it, or the Mach number on the inlet, or the Mach number on the exit. So given those, calculate all the others. And the way you approach this problem, you go back to the most basic conservation of mass. Mass says m dot in is equal to m dot exit. And so you get a relationship that area 1, V1, divided by the specific volume 1 is area 2, V2, specific volume 2. Then you go to the energy equation. With the energy equation, the change in enthalpy, H1 minus H2, is the change in the kinetic energy, V2 squared minus V1 squared. And so you could rewrite this as 2 C sub P, T1 minus T2 is equal to V2 squared minus V1 squared. You get some relationship like that. So we have an energy equation, we have a mass uh, equation. We also have a second law, or entropy. There's a couple ways to write it, but let's write it like this, that the temperatures are related, or ratios of temperatures are related to the ratio of pressure 
to the K minus 1 over K for isentropic flow of an ideal gas. So we take the mass equation and we rewrite or expand out. I forgot to emphasize it's also an ideal gas, ideal gas, such that the specific volume is RT over P, anytime I want to substitute that. And so we take and look, we can right now solve for T2 using it in this equation. You can solve for T2. So, so the first step, step A, or solve for T2, the unknown A, you know, the first unknown. You can solve for T2 right there. Then you can take a look at the mass equation, bring that down, use the ideal gas relationship, and you already have a solution for T2, and you can get an equation for V2 is equal to V1, P1 over P2, T2 over T1, and A1 over A2. Just from the conservation of mass, ideal gas equation, and T2 is calculated already. So you can think about this as you solved for the second answer, part B, and you solved for, whoops, no, that doesn't solve it. It just relates the two, right? It relates two unknowns, V1 and V2. If I use that in the energy equation, I can finally eliminate to get one unknown, and I can get V1 is equal to two times the specific heat, T1 minus T2, divided by P1 over P2 times T2 over T1 times A1 over A2, all of that squared minus 1 square root. Finally, all right, there you go. So now we have a solution for one of the unknowns, V1. Then you can go back to this equation to get the other unknown, part C, V2. Make sir? Yes, sir. This temperature of 1 is given, right? Yeah, so you would use that to choose from heat and K. Oh, if you want to account for comp temperature dependent specific heats, what I would do is I would guess T2. I would get a T average, T1 plus T2 divided by 2. I'd use that value. And then I would get a good estimate of T2. Then I would update my average and update my specific heat. I would iterate. Right? Don't iterate. I'll usually give you the values of C. Because there's no sense in iterating on tests. It's ba basically it's time constrained. You got to get through it. So iteration takes time. But it's a good thing to know. How do I get a better answer? Doesn't see using constant specific heat doesn't that limit me to inferior answers? No, it doesn't. <laughs> it, it doesn't using temperature dependent properties in a table give me better answers. Not really. Not really. Okay. So there you go. Now, how do I calculate m dot? Just come back to the equation for m dot, which is, uh, I can rewrite it here. m dot's equal to the, let's say, inlet area, inlet speed, inlet pressure, divided by R inlet temperature. And so that would give the answer for part D. And then the Mach number needs the V1 divided by the square root of K R T1, and so you can calculate the Mach number that way, E, as well as for F. The Mach number at the exit is V2 divided by the square root of K R T2 F. Now, let's say I throw some numbers in and uh, make the calculations more real. So we'll use a specific heat, C sub P, cold air, 1.005 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. K of 1.4.
and we'll use the gas constant um, 0.287 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. All right. Let's say I pick the, the pressure P1 to be a ridiculously high pressure, or really not that high, but 500 kPa, and P2 to be 100 kPa. So that what's that pressure ratio? 5 to 1, right? 500 on one side, 100. It's like it's high pressure and atmospheric pressure. If you work in PSI, right, let's say I have an air tank in my house, compressed air tank. What's the typical pressure in that air tank in the house, in a shop? How many PSI? 120. Yeah, 120. <clears throat> so how many kPa is that? Take 120 and divide by 15. I don't have a calculator, right? Or take uh, 120, 120 PSI, divide by 14.7 or 15. What do you get there? How many? Is it about eight? Eight. That's eight bar or 800 kPa. So 500 kilopascal is lower than the typical air pressure in a tank of an air compressor in your house. All right. Um, this area, just what I'm going to do is I'm going to say one here and point, uh, point something, point two five there. Just it's like a quarter. It's a reduction from one to a quarter. Uh, the inlet temperature, make it uh, 400 Kelvin. And the first thing you do is solve for the exit temperature. We would use equation A. And for this uh, problem, I'll just say that the exit temperature came in at 253 Kelvin. What do you know about that temperature? Hot or cold? It's cold. It's cold. All right. And then... We then go and calculate the velocity of the inlet, the velocity of the inlet at state one, <clears throat> about 40, 45 meters per second. All right. If you then calculate the Mach number at one, it's about 0.11. And you calculate the mass flow rate, it's about 196 kilograms per second. And the exit speed, V2, you calculate to be 567 meters per second. And the exit Mach number is 1.78. So there's a problem here. What's the problem? I have a Mach number coming out at 1.78. I can't have isentropic flow from that inlet pressure to that outlet pressure. Oh, I can make it up mathematically, but the restriction at S is constant. It's not going to happen physically. It's simply not going to happen physically. What will prevent it from happening? A shock, a shock wave. What will happen is, is the pressure will go down, 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 and then right here there will be a very irreversible shock where there'll be a big jump across the pressure drop across that very narrow region of space. So let me do this. That's why we had, I talked about this type of nozzle last time. True? One thing I didn't show you was how long ago some the Swedish inventor, Gustav de Laval, had a steam nozzle for a steam turbine in 1880s. That's a long time ago. That he figured out that it would limit the flow if it was just always converging. So what he did was he said, look it, help it converge. Something special happens when it reaches Mach 1, and then bring it out. And then he can get it to go faster than Mach 1. It'll go supersonic. Yes, sir. Exactly it. They have a propellant and they'll burn. Hydrogen is a favorite fuel with oxygen. Comes out water vapor and it sprays through those nozzles. And uh, they need a converging, diverging supersonic nozzle to get the biggest thrust out of it. 
because the mass flow rate's not changing. That's not going to increase the thrust. They've maxed out M dot. They need to max out V. So throw it out with a high speed above the speed of sound for steam at that temperature, water vapor. Yeah, so they'll have chambers that are shaped like that. And so this was, I showed this last time about through this throat region, it's Mach 1. This is a subsonic region, then a supersonic region. The Mach number in this region is greater than 1. The speed continues to grow above the blue line going above what it was in the throat, meaning it's faster than the speed of sound. The temperature is dropping, the pressure is dropping. So let's set up a nozzle which has a converging section and a diverging section, and I'll try and draw it where it's symmetric. There's my best shot at symmetric, right? Ha. And then what we're going to do is we'll have the end of the nozzle, we'll call that where it exits. And we'll put it into a large chamber. In this large chamber, we can control the back pressure by opening and closing a valve. And often think about this now as atmospheric pressure out here. But what you do is you drive that nozzle with a large supply, a large chamber. And maybe you put that at that 500 kilopascal or 120 psi or 300 psi, whatever. Think about just a large pressure the higher than atmospheric pressure, P naught high, and it's going to be sustained no matter if I open that valve a little bit on the end. Now we plot pressure on the y-axis, and we can plot P naught as that high pressure. That's not going to change. And it goes up to then it gets close to entering the valve, and then right here is the throat coming down. And here's the exit coming down. Now, what we do is we leave the valve closed, and that's our first. Can I sketch the pressure profile through this nozzle with the valve closed? Well, there's no flow through it. The pressure is uniform throughout the whole system. That's the pressure profile. So the back pressure is equal to the p naught the supply pressure. Okay, now if I open the valve a little bit, the back pressure drops. It's no, it's, so it, it goes down, and this whole back pressure is lower than what it used to be, and is lower than the, the P naught, and, and it's at, if I come all the way to the exit of the nozzle, that's the pressure at the exit of the nozzle, right? So sketch pressure profile through the nozzle. It's going to be zero, then drop. Then what happens? It goes back up. Not that exciting. Where is the lowest pressure in the nozzle? In the throat. It's all subsonic. You have the first half of it is the nozzle part. The second half is the diverging section. It acts as a diffuser subsonic diffuser. Now, before we jump off and go further, this is used a lot in engineering. This is a Venturi, the Venturi effect. Does that word make sense to you? Bernoulli's equation predicts this phenomenon perfectly because typically it's not compressible. It, the compressible effects are negligible. It happens in water. It happens in low speed air. This is the way carburetors work. I know you don't have a carburetor, but your parents did. They had cars that had carburetors. And so what happens is, is the throat where the carburetor, the air, uh, higher speed, and uh, the, they have a little jet or a p opening that draws the gasoline in and mixes it. Okay. Also, if you want to uh, uh, paint sprayers in an automobile shop, they use compressed air. And they have a tank with paint spray in a bowl underneath the spray nozzle. And when they let the air through, the air goes straight in. It doesn't, the air doesn't go down and hit the, the paint and force it up. It just goes through a small little um, venturi a section where now the air pressure is less than atmosphere and it draws up the paint out of the can through a straw. 
True. And then even on a garden hose, if you buy it from Lowe's or Home Depot or one of those, you want to get rid of bugs on your plants or in the grass and you have a garden hose and you have a herbicide stuck in the bottom, right? You faucet goes like that. The water is not going to go down and push the herbicide out. There's a little straw that goes to the bottom and it sucks it out through the Venturi effect. There's a lot of these applications, okay? So we should know a little bit about that. But now if you continue to open that valve, this exit pressure drops, you get even a stronger Venturi effect, but then you get to a maximum where what happens is, is the flow right here gets up to, based on the temperature in the throat, it, the speed of sound in the throat, it gets to Mach 1. And that's a special breaking point right there. Something different is going to happen. If you're a little bit below Mach 1, then you're still subsonic. And when you go into the expanding region of this converging, diverging nozzle, it'll still act as a diffuser. But if you draw down this pressure a little more, what will happen is, is the pressure right here, it'll want to start to go and continue to accelerate in the diverging section of that nozzle. And as it accelerates, its speed now is it's supersonic. Now, if you just drop the pressure a little bit by opening this valve just a little bit below, it won't go very far, and then it'll hit something very funny. They'll have a shock wave, a normal shock inside, not very far past the throat. And what will happen is there'll be a jump back to subsonic flow, and then it'll be subsonic diffuser for the rest of that section. So let's say you drop, open the valve even some more, and then that drops that pressure even more. It'll draw that further out like that, but maybe it hits the shock and then comes up. So it has a greater length at which it's accelerating, 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 but then you hit the shock, okay? I need to move my axis down some. Give me some more room. True? Okay. Because this is going to continue. You could go all the way out and draw it out such that you still have a shock to bring it up to the pressure that's the exit pressure, which is controlled by how open that valve is. And then if you open the valve some more, you get less of a shock. But now that shock is kind of outside the end of the nozzle. It's not a normal shock. It's an oblique shock. It's very complicated. And then you can even draw it down some more, the pressure down even more. I needed to color code that. And what you can get is here, even draw it down some more and you'll have another shock like that, okay? Where these shocks uh, are going where the pressure uh, on this first case is less than the pressure after the shock, but on the very last case that I sketch, the pressure right before the shock is higher than right after the shock. All right? So it's very complicated. But the idea is, is you have choked flow right here. All right. Once I start to have this diverging section of the nozzle being supersonic, does the pressure in here change in the converging section of the nozzle? Or does that velocity profile stay the same for all of these cases in here where I start to really open that valve? It stays the same. So basically, the mass flow rate through the system is flat when I have it wide open, this valve wide open. So what they do is they plot this, the pressure back pressure compared to the static initial pressure. When it's one, you have no flow, there's a starting point. And then as you open the valve, the back pressure goes down, the flow goes up. You open it some more, the flow goes up, the flow goes up. But then sometimes after that, you can open it all you want. The flow doesn't, the mass flow rate doesn't increase through the nozzle. It's maxed out. 
So this is right where M is equal to 1 in the throat. And then you can't get any more mass flow rate out for the same p naught, for the same back pressure p naught. okay? Now, you, what you will do is you'll have a higher exit speed, which will give you more thrust, because the product of m dot and v gives you the thrust, true? Follow all that? All right, let's solve a problem. These equations, I think we established last time about how you have the stagnation temperature and the stagnation pressure and the actual temperature as a function of the Mach number. So the temperature is going to go down as the flow increases. And even as the flow goes above Mach 1, the temperature goes down even more. Likewise, the pressure goes down below the stagnation pressure as M increases. Let's solve this problem. So hydrogen... H2, it behaves as an ideal gas and expands isentropically through a converging nozzle from a large tank at 10 bar 500 Kelvin. Evaluate the properties at a temperature of 450 Kelvin. So get temperature dependent properties, but use the, the constant uh, values. So C sub P, and you know what? I think I left my notes up there on this one. And I'm running out of time, aren't I? So they have a, in table A20, they have a hydrogen. And you can look up at 450 uh, Kelvin. You can look up the C sub P is 14.5 kilojoules per kilogram. Kelvin. And you can look up K. K is 1.398. So they want you to determine what is the critical pressure. Well, the symbol for that is P asterisk. And what does that correspond to? That's where it's choked flow or Mach number is 1. So go back to the equation that we just had. P naught over P critical is equal to what is that? It's going to be 1 minus, but 1 plus k minus 1 over 2. The Mach number will be 1, all raised to the k minus 1 over k. So P critical is equal to, let me write it this way, P naught divided by 1 plus k minus 1 over 2 to the power k over k minus 1. And you just stick your value. What did they have? 500 kilopascal in there. And the K we looked up out of the table at 450 Kelvin. Likewise, the critical temperature. Use this equation. That's going to be the stagnation temperature. 1 plus K minus 1 over 2. Okay. Oh, I'm running out of time, aren't I? I don't have time to do this one justice. Well, we're done with uh, compressible flow effects. There's so much more to cover, but we're done, okay? Next time we meet, into refrigeration. Does anybody read ahead in the textbook at all? I encourage you to please read ahead in the textbook. It always pays dividends, this class as well as any other class, okay? Thank you. Let's solve a problem. Hydrogen behaves as an ideal gas. It expands isentropically through a converging nozzle from a large tank at 10 bar and 500 Kelvin. Evaluate properties at 450 Kelvin such that the, uh, you can get the C sub P. So if I go to the tables and I want to get the specific heat, a constant pressure for uh, hydrogen, it's at that temperature, it's 14.501 kilojoule per kilogram Kelvin. Likewise, K, the ratio of specific heats, is 1.398. Now, let's ask the question, what is the critical t pressure? That's at P asterisk. And the critical temperature, T asterisk. That would be if the Mach number was 1. What would be that temperature and pressure? All right. So it starts with P naught of 10 bar. 
He used equations that we just described such that the P asterisk is equal to P naught divided by 1 plus K minus 1 over 2 to the K minus 1 over K. Whoops. Yeah, K over K minus 1. And you calculate that the critical pressure is 5.286 bar. Way too many digits, but there you go. Meaning that in the throat, if you had a 10 large tank and a 10 bar supply, it would be 5.3 bar in the throat. That's right. That's an exit for the uh, nozzle, correct? Uh, it's, it's a converging nozzle, and it would be choked right there at the, conver at the throat. I, I'm not doing where it's the throat, then it expands out. But even if you did have it expanding out, even if you had a converging, diverging nozzle, right? and the Mach number in this other section is growing, it's greater than one, does the pressure right here in the throat change or does it get stuck at P asterisk? It gets stuck at P asterisk. That's right. Right? Remember, let's go back if I could show you this plot. This pressure right here is stuck at the critical pressure. No matter if I continue to decrease the back pressure and make more of the diverging section supersonic. Make sense? All right. And then the same thing, T asterisk is equal to T naught divided by 1 plus K minus 1 over 2. And you find that that temperature would be 417 Kelvin. It's colder. It's lower temperature than the 500 T naught. 